we're, let's talk about building a healthy home. Um, there are ways, there are things you can do. Remember we talked about using low or no VOC or OSB. Um, air and seal, these are things we've already covered. Air and seal it. Um, use the low VOC paints and stains and finishes. And also look for lower and no VOC carpeting and cabinetry because um, carpeting, the backing of a carpet will oftentimes contain volatile organic chemicals, even the recycled products. This, the glue that they use um, for this backing material will contain volatile organic chemicals. So you have to be real careful what you, what you get. The cabinetry, cabinets are oftentimes made from particle board. Particle board has another type of resin which contains formaldehyde. It actually tends to contain more formaldehyde than you'll find in OSB. So be real careful with cabinetry, um, what, what you get, uh, where you buy it. Generally, you know, any particle board and furniture, whether it's a bookshelf or, or a cabinet, any of that is going to have uh, formaldehyde in it. Question somewhere? Yes. Oh uh, yeah. So uh, these products do they continuously give off VOC? <coughs> well, that's the a, or don't necessarily It'll do give it off for a while. It, it could outgas for a year or two in your house. So it could have a pretty long cycle. Yeah. Actually, um, when it comes to cabinetry, this is kind of like a forte. Um, sure. Most plywood contains as much formaldehyde and, and potential VOC um, off gassing as does. Um, particle board, and particle board that's used for cabinetry is usually no mean board, so it's got a limit on the outside, which actually helps to contain that VOC issue. That's true. It's very true. Now, oftentimes, there will be one end that's open, though. You know, yeah. it'll, it'll be sealed on all sides except for one cup, so you do get some release. Um, vapor barriers, why we install vapor barriers. We're going to talk a lot about vapor barriers later on, but a vapor barrier is basically uh, polyethylene, 6 mil polyethylene. Um, sheet that you generally in a cold climate like ours you apply it on the inside of the wall so if this is just a framed wall for example you frame it blow in the insulation and then apply a vapor barrier the idea is to prevent moisture from moving into a wall not really very effective to be honest with you but vapor barriers one of the advantages is if you've used OSB with formaldehyde as an exterior sheathing it'll help reduce the amount of, of, of VOC that enters your home. It'll help. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to talk a lot more about vapor barriers. Um, you want to be careful about sealing the leaks in the building air envelope. If you're using OSB for an exterior sheathing, you want to be sure that you seal up any penetrations in the wall, electrical outlets and light switches. You want to be sure those are sealed because, frankly, that's where more air moves in and out of the house than directly through the wall talk more about that later. Um, bathroom and kitchen ventilation is essential to a healthy home to get moisture out of the house, um, to, to remove pollutants from a gas stove, nitrogen oxide, for example, and carbon monoxide, which are released from a, 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 a stove, you know, from the, from the burners. Um, another, another idea, we really like to seal up our houses, make them really airtight. When you do that, you need to, do, you need to uh, ventilate. The, the, the motto is seal it tight but ventilate it right. And, and so seal up a house, make it really airtight, but you've got to get, you've got to create an air exchange. So you do it artificially. We'll talk more about that as we talk about passive heating and cooling. Um, so a lot of people say, well, gee, why don't you just make leaky walls? And I'll explain why it's better to seal up a house and then control the ventilation with a, with a, a, a mechanical system that brings in fresh air but you want to do that very carefully because, uh, or that sucks out stale air and brings in fresh air. And you want to install an energy or a heat recovery ventilator so that in the dead of winter, if you're bringing in ice cold air from outside, fresh air, and you're, you're exhausting stale air from the house, you, you don't want to lose all that heat that you've worked so hard to get. So these heat recovery ventilators have a heat exchanger in them that allows the two air masses, the cold air coming in, the warm air going out, to pass each other, not contact each other, not physically contact each other, but to flow in separate ductwork close enough that the heat of the air going out, much of the heat for the air leaving the house, is transferred to the heat, to the cold air coming in. And they're about 
mm, 60, 70%, 80% efficient, depending on the model. 70 or 80% is a pretty good rating, so you're not losing a lot of heat. Um, mold and moisture has become a critical element in all building, not just green building. Um, <clears throat> if you control moisture, you're going to control mold. And it's a real tricky, it's real tricky. Um, most of the attention in building has been on the vapor barrier, which I just told you in a cold climate like this is six mil polyethylene attached to the framing members. And the idea behind it was that people are trying to, to reduce the penetration of moisture through the wall. Well, I'm here to tell you that very little moisture penetrates directly through a wall. Very, very little. Most of it goes through, through other areas. So um, there's been a lot of a focus on that. But really, if you look at moisture in walls and attics, the main source is inadequate flashing. Okay? That's where most of the moisture gets in a house, gets into the walls, gets into the attic, is because you haven't done a decent job of flashing. And for those of you who aren't builders, flashing has nothing to do with uh, exposing yourself. Flashing is, is anytime you have, for example, a, a roof line that meets a wall, you got, um, you know, you, you uh, apply a metal flashing, which is basically just metal that bridges that gap and prevents moisture, liquid moisture from, uh, entering that gap between those two building components. I'll show you a picture of some flashing shortly. If you're not a builder, you'll see flashing around the uh, penetration of a chimney, where a chimney comes up through a roof. There's metal flashing around that, and the whole idea is to keep any moisture that might, say, land on the, on the chimney and trickle down isn't going to drip down into your house. It's going to hit that flashing and be pushed away. Okay, that's the number one source of moisture in walls. We pay almost all the attention goes to vapor barriers, but that's one of the key things to building a, a durable home is good flashing. The second level of entry, the second most important source of moisture is our penetrations in the wall. And that includes, you know, any time with plumbing or electrical penetrates a wall, electrical outlets, um, switches, recessed lighting, where we talked about recessed cans earlier, that's the those are the, that's the number two source is all these penetrations in the in the wall in exterior walls, and then finally it's diffusion through solid surfaces. That's direct movement. If you could compare the two, compare the three, if you qualitatively or quantitatively, a gallon would represent the amount of moisture that gets in a house through flashing. A quart would maybe be the amount that gets through penetrations in a in a shot glass would be how much actually diffuses directly through the walls. So pay attention in building to the two areas where most of the water gets in. That's where we have to really pay the most attention. There's an example of flashing. This is a step flashing, metal flashing. It, it, um, it extends from <clears throat> this wall down onto the roof, and it basically seals that gap so that moisture cannot enter. Um, and penetrate the wall at that point.